So when preparing for this talk, I wasn't quite sure whether I was going to speak to uh, experts of growth theory or more people more interested in general about uh, patterns of growth. So uh, I decided that I perhaps present some materials, some material which uh, tries to compare a little bit growth patterns uh, across the world and across Asia, where my main, uh, my main, if you want, uh, concern is that uh, there are different patterns if you compare the two Asian giants, namely India and China. And uh, if you want, the main theme is something which uh, I think Paul Krugman uh, and others have already touched upon 20 years ago which is growth based on what's called perspiration or rather than inspiration. And uh, my main theme is that so far what we have seen has been a huge accumulation of factors of production, both in terms of quantity and quality. Um, and uh, the question then at the end is if you want, how far you can go with that kind of growth pattern. So, one of the major uh, points I wanted to make is that uh, one should look really uh, very carefully at the accumulation of human capital and uh, that their quantity maybe is less important than, than quality. So that yes, if you look at human capital you need to focus on education but uh, the quality of that is perhaps uh, even more important uh, than the quantity. And it's also more challenging uh, to measure and also, of course, then to, to do something about it in terms of uh, governmental uh, policy. Now, um, before getting into that, let me make one point about uh, demography which uh, I know is uh, discussed a lot here in this country, but also in Europe, where I come from. Uh, demography, of course, is uh, one important uh, driver of growth. But there, two aspects are very often mixed up, which uh, are very different, I think, in their economic effects. One is that you have the, peop the fact that people live for longer, aging, and that, in my view, has very little impact on growth per se, but it has an impact, of course, uh, on fiscal policy, on uh, pension systems, um, retirement age, and all that uh, part of the discussion. But what is really important for growth is really uh, the other side of demography, which is uh, fertility or uh, the growth rate uh, in, the, in, the, in the young population. And that determines basically your future uh, labor force or the growth rate of your future labor force. And that is, uh, I think, the one factor which ha can have an impact on, uh, on growth. I'm coming back to that. Before that, let me go, however, into one aspect which uh, I think has been neglected to some extent both in Europe and the US and maybe has some bearing here in China its, itself, which is that uh, in the stages of transition, in the demographic stages of transition, uh, we all know that when fertility rates decline, at first you have a very favorable period during which what is called the support ratio is very favorable because if fewer uh, young people, fewer old people, and in the middle, the most productive um, uh, are the most uh, numerous ones. And that tends to accelerate um, growth rates uh, with growth rates uh, investment. It uh, tends also to stimulate financial markets. And very often these things get uh, out of hand. So you have a financial market boom followed by a bust. And that's why actually when you look at it uh, a bit in longer term perspective, you see that very often these uh, population peaks uh, coincide with financial markets, booms and busts. I'm not saying they have to, 
I'm just saying they can. So what I show here, you here is the, the support ratio, meaning how many people you have in working age relative to those who need support, the old age and the young ones. And uh, as I said earlier, when this ratio goes up, uh, the economy usually performs very well. High growth rates, as I said, stimulates investment, stimulates financial market valuation, uh, stimulates also real estate markets, um, and therefore uh, things seem to be going very well, very easily. And as I said, financial markets have a tendency to, uh, to uh, exaggerate this phenomenon, and then when things turn around, um, it can change very quickly. So you see here that uh, if you look both at Japan or the EU and the US, their turning points in demographic terms coincided also with major financial turnarounds. Uh, but you also see, of course, immediately that uh, Japan and Europe or the US are a mere molehill, very soft uh, uh, peaks compared to the one which, uh, which China is having basically these days. Uh, so that is, I think, why one should be very much aware of the fact that uh, when these, uh, these uh, demographic ratios, in this particular case, the support ratio turn around, uh, then there's a danger that the, the growth pattern might have to change quickly. And uh, when that gets into financial markets, it very often has uh, very important uh, determinants, uh, very important implications for financial markets. Um, let me now come back to what I said earlier about the, the, the pure demographics. Um, and at least well, in Europe, you hear a lot of chatter about people saying, oh yes, uh, China has had a very strong growth performance, but now its demography will be very similar to that of Europe. And therefore, it will have European growth rates. Right? Of course, that's for me a non sequitur. One doesn't follow from the others, but uh, um, I just wanted to, uh, to show you the data, which perhaps uh, you might uh, have already seen. Um, this is the kind of picture that many people have in mind when they compare uh, China to India. Uh, they see that uh, if you take the um, light blue line, which is China, that the working age population is now um, about to decline, um, whereas the working age population of India which used to be much slow, lower, is now projected actually to increase much and surpass that of, 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 uh, of China, when actually by, uh, by 2050 then it's far away, but still, then you have a very strong turnaround in a sense that uh, um, the ratio used to be about 970, 790, if you want, in favor of China, it will be the other way around, in favor for, of India. That, as I said earlier, for me is, uh, is only one very small aspect of the story. Uh, the more important one is uh, that, and that is, I think, a way to look at also the growth prospects of, of China, is that instead of just looking at the population, uh, what I propose is to look at basically the population times the years of schooling incorporated in each cohort, which is different. So that means that even if you have a stagnant working age population, but if the new cohorts coming in have much more schooling than the old ones exiting, then you still have, can have a positive growth rate of the aggregate uh, schooling times population. And in that sense, I would say actually uh, the, the uh, education adjusted population of China will actually continue to, to grow. Although the numbers go down, the new population, I think part of it is in this room here, has a much higher rate of uh, tertiary education, has much, had many more years of schooling uh, than the 50 or 60 year olds which exit the, the working age population at the other end. So in that sense, I would say the growth rate of uh, the population in China weighted by education will actually continue to grow for quite some time. Whereas in the US, it is much lower because the difference in the education levels between the younger and the elder are not that large. 
If I had Japan here, the numbers would already be negative because in Japan, the level of education has stagnated at a high level, but it has stagnated. So you don't get any additional growth impetus for them. And you see that for India, of course, which is that uh, the, the orange line here, you see that the relative growth rates are uh, very high for quite some time. Uh, because in India, there's also a very strong catch up in terms of education still going on. And of course, the actual growth rates of the population are, uh, are remain much higher than, than here in China. Um, so the, the basic point is that uh, if one looks just at pure demographics, even on that point of view, from that point of view, I would say there's reasons to believe that the growth in, in China can continue for quite some time and that the growth rate, that the growth potential in India might actually become higher. But of course, in terms of education, what matters more is the, the quality than the, than the quantity, the years of schooling. And that is, of course, extremely difficult to measure. Uh, the only quantitative indicator we have are these studies from uh, international uh, educational comparison programs like TIMSS or the one that is most widely used is the one from the OECD, uh, which measures uh, the relative performance uh, of 16-year-old students on, uh, on standardized tests. And um, perhaps as you all know, China has participated in the last uh, issue of uh, PISA 2012 for the first time ever. Not all of China, but the district of Shanghai. And uh, perhaps, uh, I don't know whether there was much in the, in the Chinese press. Uh, the result was what you see here um, in the middle red bar, which is that uh, Shanghai, China came out at the very top of the entire OECD ranking. There has been a lot of discussion in Europe and elsewhere whether that reflects all of China or just elite school in, school in Shanghai. And I would be interested to hear what the audience has to, has to say about that. Uh, but um, actually what I have done here is I have taken the average between Shanghai and Hong Kong, so to get it down a little bit, um, perhaps that is more realistic uh, for, the entire, um, for the entire country. Then I've put in here the US, which is more or less OECD average. The OECD actually defines the OECD average as 500, so you see the US is more or less there. Europe, by the way, is all over the place. Europe, some European countries, Northern European countries are much above. Southern European countries are much below. But the average for the weighted population average for Europe is around 500 also. And then there's a case of India, which is not much discussed, because India just participated in one uh, issue of, uh, of the OECD test with three uh, states uh, from India. Because in India, education is responsibility of the states and of the federal level. And uh, the result was that uh, India actually came out at the very bottom of uh, the, I don't know, 30, 37 or 38 countries which did participate. And the Indian authorities complained that uh, the PISA, PISA testing was discriminating against their culture and withdrew. Um, but uh, Actually, the numbers which came out, uh, um, which I have reported here, um, are corroborated with, by other evidence uh, that you see, see elsewhere. Uh, the PISA uh, organization themselves says that a difference in 50 points corresponds to about one year of schooling on average. So. That means that if you take, let's say, China against the US, the difference there corresponds to one half year of schooling, meaning that if you have two people of the same, with the same years of schooling formally in numbers, then the PISA test would suggest that effectively the Chinese have had half a year more. Right? So we take people with 10 years of schooling, you would say the Chinese effectively have 10.5 and the Americans 10. The problem is then if you apply that metric to India, you would have to subtract uh, four years from the official in Indian numbers. And that would suggest that uh, the effective quality weighted numbers of years of schooling in India is actually 
four years below what the numbers which are reported uh, by the World Bank and others. So there's an extremely large quality gap between uh, these two um, um, big uh, Asian countries. And I think that is one of the, the key issues also going forward, uh, where that gap will be maintained or whether it will be changed and what are the, its impacts on, on the economy. Um, so if we take these numbers, therefore, which I showed so far, what we see is that uh, you have uh, in China a very um, high rate of, uh, of schooling plus very high quality uh, uh, of the schooling so far. And uh, experience all around the world has shown that if you have that uh, kind of uh, quality of the population, that actually makes R&D spending uh, possible or it makes it profitable for enterprises to do it. I don't regard R&D spending as something that, is, that governments decide upon or should push, but it is a spending that private companies should do and they will do it when they have enough engineers and scientists around available to do it. You see that in Europe, by the way, very well. In countries where you have lots of uh, highly educated people, there's lots of R&D spending, for example, in the Nordic countries. And in the South, where you don't, there's lo lo a lot less. That's why in Europe also this uh, official goal of having 3% of GDP in R&D spending doesn't make sense for all countries might make sense on average, but makes sense to spend on R&D only where you have actually population which can do that. And then what we have done at my institute is just to say, okay, uh, we have some projections for the uh, GDP of, of China and, and other countries. And uh, let's assume then that uh, everybody converges to a 3% uh, of uh, R&D as percent of GDP. And then what is the total spending? And uh, so that's why you have these two yellow lines here. The lower one is Chinese spending at the present rate. And the upper one is uh, the spending uh, if China also goes to the 3% norm, compounded, of course, by growth rates, which we think will not continue at the present level, but will go down, but still uh, with positive growth rates. So and of course, what you see is that then, uh, given the pure force of numbers, uh, China alone will account for uh, more R&D spending than the EU uh, by about 2020 and more than uh, about the same as the EU and, and, and US combined uh, by the year 2030. So the, the potential for R&D spending is there and it's huge given the, the, the quantity and the quality of the education numbers which I showed uh, earlier. Okay, so that that takes care of the one part of, uh, of the growth prospect, which I mentioned earlier, human capital. Um, let me be quick on, on investment and uh, the, the physical capital, which is also much discussed here. Um, and here I just wanted to make uh, about two basic points. One is that uh, the Asian growth model is very much uh, based on high, high savings. That's well known. Um, but the second point is a very basic economic one, which is that uh, a higher stock of capital doesn't give you a higher growth rate. It gives you a higher level of GDP, but not permanently higher growth rate. And I think that's very often forgotten because you, set, you see uh, very soon uh, decreasing returns to scale. Um, and you see that uh, the first point you see in the, in the savings rates uh, which you basically need because uh, experience shows that you have to finance most of your investment at home. International capital can substitute for domestic savings only so far. And I've given you here the IMF numbers which have some projections around. And uh, what's interesting is that uh, in both India and China, the growth rates have gone up, uh, the invest uh, savings rate have gone up a lot over the last uh, uh, 15 years or so and have st more or less stabilized at a level which uh, is different, but very much higher than those of the mature economies. And that is at least projected to, to remain for quite some time. And that of course then leads to an uh, ever increasing uh, capital stock, which again you see here. Um, 
And okay, nothing new here, but the interesting thing is that uh, by around 2030, which is our forecast horizon, you see again the capital stock converging. And if you remember the picture which I showed earlier for R&D spending, which is also converging, so you see that uh, in terms of physical capital and human capital, uh, there will be, uh, will be rather quick uh, convergence uh, uh, in what is available in terms of uh, pure, uh, uh, pure factors of production. So my point of view would be what you have seen in Asia uh, is basically uh, perspiration. It's a combination of favorable demographics plus uh, high investment in, uh, in also human capital, especially here in China. Uh, the, the quality of that investment varies enormously. And um, that uh, the key question which remains is, as you accumulate all that capital, both physical and human, the, the marginal rate of return will decline. And sooner or later, that's no longer going to be enough to create growth. Reach a certain level of, of income, which might be a famous middle income trap or level. Um, but if you want to go beyond that, uh, other factors have to come in. Uh, what are called uh, inspiration, namely developing new products, uh, being yourself and the frontier, developing new economies. And I think that is the next challenge uh, for this country uh, and for Asia in general. Thank you very much.